Uh, great. Uh, so my speech today, I shall be um, delivering in three parts. Uh, one on the um, global context of uh, benchmark reform. Um, I shall then dwell briefly on the EU idiosyncrasies uh, to uh, benchmark reform and, uh, of course, uh, recent uh, legislative changes. And then conclude, uh, I guess, with what is the most important part is what do we now expect from the private sector? Uh, because I shall be making the case that the public sector has done quite a bit. Uh, the public sector has driven this process, uh, not least through the working group. Uh, so I wish to thank um, the uh, working group, uh, the ECB for hosting the working group, ING for providing uh, the chairmanship, a very able chairmanship of this working group. And I think we have come a very uh, far uh, a good way uh, in reforming eyeball rates and that is why at the end of the day uh, now there is also a role for the um, private sector. Now the global context um, is, is, is pretty obvious. Uh, IOSCO uh, started to uh, think about interest rate and FX reforms in 2012. Um, I think there were the main tenets of this reform was clearly that panel and panel bank benchmarks uh, so benchmarks that um, require rate contributors um, are not sufficiently robust, are prone to uh, manipulation, and lately also suffer from a scarcity of contributions. I think therefore the international consensus was that the existing rates must be made more robust, while we need to embark on a serious effort to find alternative rates, uh, which can be produced either replacing existing panel bank rates or in some jurisdictions existing alongside the uh, panel bank uh, rates. But the consensus internationally is that panel bank rates have a few idiosyncrasies which make them somewhat vulnerable uh, to um, the willingness to contribute and of course to manipulation. Now the EU has acted quite quickly, so after IOSCO has started this reform effort and uh, alongside the FSB uh, in 2012, uh, the EU has come out with a benchmark regulation in 2016 and the decisive feature, or the de defining feature rather of that benchmark regulation is that it doesn't just cover interest rate benchmarks, it also covers foreign exchange and a host of other benchmarks, um, commodity benchmarks. Uh, even regulated data benchmarks. So there was a lot of criticism that the EU went uh, beyond the original aim, uh, which is to reform um, panel bank interest rate benchmarks and of course panel-based FX rates. But on the other hand, uh, our benchmark regulation has served us pretty well, I would say, now that it's time to come to a serious reform of the interest rate benchmarks. And that is, as Isabel Schnabel mentioned, uh, we, we like seat belts, we like safety nets, uh, we like to have a reform where we can actually get along the reform without being too concerned on impacts that it has on huge trillions worth of legacy portfolios. So the benchmark regulation has served us very well in that sense because it gave us a forum to be the first jurisdiction worldwide, and I'm uh, quite proud of this, to have a safety net uh, so that we can take care of the legacy stock and that the worry about the legacy stock does not eclipse the serious works that we have to do on finding suitable uh, replacement rates. Because I think one of the biggest issues um, and one of the biggest um, breaks on, on a um, successful um, phase out of unstable rates and in favor of transaction based rates is the huge worry that we had, how will this affect the legacy contracts? How will this affect trillions worth of derivatives? How will this affect uh, debt which is issued um, and a series of other financial instruments which are in scope of the benchmark regulation? And that whole concern about legacy contracts has eclipsed and has put a break on the serious efforts to find a new generation of more reliable benchmarks because you can't reform benchmarks if you don't give the financial sector sufficient certainty how to accomplish contractual continuity with respect to their legacy rates. 
So on the 30th of November, uh, we have uh, achieved a political compromise on a new benchmark regulation. And this is um, a benchmark regulation which gives the European Commission powers to designate statutory replacement rates for critical benchmarks, which would be uh, Euribor, and for um, benchmarks which are systemic uh, for the um, European financial infrastructure, which is LIBOR. And as you know, LIBOR is no longer a critical benchmark as of the UK's departure, but nevertheless, uh, it will remain a systemically relevant benchmark, hence this um, somewhat uh, dual formulation of our powers. And I don't want to dwell into the exact details of the powers because we are gonna have a, a Q&A session um, at the end of the formal presentations. Uh, the thing that I want to say at this stage is that these powers are optional. They may be exercised, but we would also be quite happy not to exercise them. But they do constitute something which is important for this reform process, and that is a safety net. So whatever happens in the future reform, we will be able to deploy a safety net to ensure that there is contractual continuity in the huge outstanding legacy portfolio that we have on the balance sheets of our banking sectors. And I think that legal certainty that there is now a safety net as we move forward in these reforms is of crucial importance. So that brings me to the third uh, part of my uh, short opening. What do we now expect from the market participants? So while the um, legislator has actually done its, uh, its job, we are the first uh, jurisdiction which has uh, replacement power, which work by statute. So they will, by statute, automatically replace all IBOR references in existing legacies once they're triggered. Not all of the IBOR rates, of course, may have statutory replacements, recommendations by risk-free rate working groups, uh, such as the Euro risk-free rate working group or the ARC in the United States or the um, risk-free rate working group that is convened by the Bank of England. So there is a first limitation to any of these uh, statutory replacement powers, which is that not all disappearing IBOR rates or not all IBOR rates that will be reformed and therefore dis be discontinued over time will actually have necessarily statutory replacements. So we have to be very careful um, that we do not rely on this safety net even if there is no risk-free rate working group recommendation. Um, it will be very difficult uh, to work it. Uh, we do then have a public consultation uh, process, but our preference is clearly that the legacy rate, so the rate for the legacy stock, which um, still has to be wound down, is something which is uh, recommended by the private sector itself or um, by the risk-free rate working groups uh, that are convened uh, by various central banks. Not all, of these um, fallback rates will have an agreed spread. Another um, important feature of our fallback rate is that it requires a recommendation by the stakeholders on the base rate. It requires a recommendation by the stakeholders on the applicable spread, which is the spread uh, that avoids the value transfer on the legacy stock. And of course, uh, not all jurisdictions will possibly have a credit sensitive rate, uh, so a rate with a spread, and therefore, again, these powers may have some limitations. It is a safety net. There is no guarantee that it will be uh, deployed for all IBOR rates. Uh, we can, however, it, um, deploy it if the conditions are met, which is that there is a consensus among stakeholders, either because the central bank uh, convened risk-free rate groups have agreed on such a rate, have agreed on a spread, have agreed on the consequential changes that the introduction of this replacement rate means for existing legacy contracts. In that case, we can act. If those three conditions are not fulfilled, we can still act, but it will be more difficult. Hence, we have built in an additional window of consultation uh, to cover also those cases where recommendations or stakeholder consensus has not yet been achieved. And a final feature of this benchmark reform is that we have extended the so-called EMIR relief provisions. So there will be no margining, uh, there will be no um, 
additional uh, margin requirement or no clearing requirement triggered uh, solely on the uh, basis of having to change a IBOR reference in an existing contract. So this will, any amendment which is triggered by the statutory replacement will not be considered as triggering either a clearing obligation or an additional margining requirement. So in conclusion, uh, the public sector has done a lot and I wish to thank especially the participants of the risk free rate working group here at the ECB. Um, the legislators have sprung into action, uh, I, I would say, have created a safety net uh, to cushion any kind of value transfer in the existing stock as we move away from panel bank rates. Now over to the private sector to continue the contractual negotiations, uh, to do as much in the private sector uh, approach as possible, because the safety net will work in some circumstances, but there are no guarantees that it will capture every um, aspect or every single eyeball rate that may in future be discontinued. Is this a safety net? It is an additional safeguard, but as most of these things, it is not entirely perfect. So I would like to conclude there and yet again express my sincere thanks uh, for the um, participants in the risk free rate group for the excellent work that has been accomplished and of course uh, also look uh, into the future um, and uh, with confidence look at the um, additional challenges that we will be facing together. Thank you very much.